All right, this is the Business of Social Podcast powered by STN Digital. I'm your host, David Brickley, as always, joined by producer Will and uh, Mr. Kelly. We got another panel edition episode ready for the the good people out there. This time in the esports gaming world, where I know you, uh, you're you very passionate about as well on your side. Yeah, yeah, definitely uh, a little bit of a passion project here. And we've been interested in gaming and esports for a while and trying to you know learn more about that industry. So um, definitely a great panel today with three guys who all come from a little bit of a different corner of those of those industries. So excited to hear what knowledge they have and, and what they think and what they see in the industry. Yeah, we got um, Mike Dalton. He's the vice president of global marketing at Unicorn. They are essentially the sports book for video games and esports, which is an incredible venture um, that I'm really excited to dive into with him. We have an SDSU asset grad, go Aztecs, Ray Kalmeyer. He's a CEO of Inclu. Um, and they're all one platform where they do VR, AR, mixed reality, which is a really, really growing uh, space. And then Shane Beerwith is, sorry, Shane Beerwith is the EVP of global marketing at Maximum Games and Modest Games. Um, and as you guys know, potentially Maximum Games is a global top 20 video game publisher and 10th fastest growing private company in San Francisco. So three amazing gentlemen, three guys I think can provide different insights in each of their different industries and really excited to dig in. I think, Will, I was looking at, I know Q1 or going to Q2, like Twitch streams went up 40%. Um, a lot of people think esports or gaming is kind of this, you know, secondary thing, but $159 billion that they're estimating in 2020, the video game global market, that's what they're forecasting. That's four times box office revenue and almost three times music industry revenue. Yet box office and music, I feel like culturally, or when you look at marketing plans or advertising plans are in a whole nother stratosphere. Um, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be interesting now that we've gone through this acceleration on the digital side and gaming side and all that, how that's going to change, you know, marketing and advertising forever, potentially. Yeah. If you went up to someone on the street and said, hey, rank these three industries. Yeah, right. It's the most, I would say they'd all put have, you know, have gaming at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, really exciting time. Excited to talk to these guys. And I think you get a little bit of gambling, a little bit of studios, a little bit of partnerships, and then uh, just as a whole, the industry. So Pretty excited to hear what they have to say. So we've been, uh, ever since you know the COVID-19 pandemic uh, happened, we've kind of been rolling this out industry by industry. Well, well we've done retail, we've done uh, food and beverage, we've done, um, what else? What am I, what the I third missing? was uh, a mixed bag of direct TV and um, authentic brands. Group. Yeah, so more in the brand space, oh, technical I'm space. No, I'm sorry, not And now, uh, yeah, my boy, Sean Robertson. But now we go into the esports okay. and gaming. I think a lot of the listeners um, are excited to learn more about this industry, so I am excited as well. Here we go. The Business Social Special Edition Panel Edition Esports and Gaming. All right. We've uh, continued our panel series here on the Business Social. We're really excited, uh, like we mentioned before, to dive into the esports and gaming world. And we have three gentlemen that are just experts in this and really dominate different sectors of the esports and gaming industry. I'm uh, really excited for this conversation, guys. So let me start off with you, uh, Mike. Why don't you let the uh, let the listeners know what you do day to day and what you oversee? Yeah, awesome. So I'm at Unicorn, VP of Global Marketing, manage an epic team. Uh, we're in the esports wagering space. So working with both Carl and Rahul, who co-founded the business about five or six years uh, ago. So having lots of fun. It's been a busy couple of months, especially with COVID. I love it. Uh, Shane, take it away. I have to unmute myself. Yeah, so I'm Shane, Shane Beer with... Uh, uh, executive Vice President of Global Marketing over at Maximum Games and Modus. So Maximum Games is a top 20 publisher. We do a lot of physical distribution and sub-publishing for uh, large AA, AAA video game publishers and developers. And then we recently launched a new division of Maximum Games, which is called Modus, which is our full publishing division. So we uh, provide AAA services to independent developers looking for uh, global reach when it comes to publishing. So um, I oversee all of our global marketing departments. We have offices in uh, California and the UK. We have a development studio over in Brazil. Um, and yeah, I'm in charge of all the marketing operations strategy. I also do a lot of business development, um, work with platform partners, all that fun stuff. 
And then those of you that are watching on YouTube, just some great plants in the background, nice and watered, looking good out there in <laughs> SF. 100% um, my wife. I have nothing yeah, to do with you that. You can't take credit for it. <laughs> and then, uh, Ray, I'll throw it to you as a fellow ad like a grad. I, I love you already, so uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so after leaving San Diego, I jumped up to the Bay Area. It's been about 15 years in the games industry. Uh, today, I'm the CEO and founder of Enclue. So we are a international publisher and developer of uh, immersive augmented reality content. We launched a major installation right next to Nintendo last year, E3, uh, focusing on large scale immersive events where hundreds of players come together with immersive headsets, really future technology today. Um, and then the pandemic happened. So uh, large events and conferences pretty much dried up, uh, understandably so. So we pivoted earlier this year into applying that same sort of gamified interaction layer on top of regular human processes. And right now we're seeing a massive boom in education, also disrupted by COVID. Raise your hand if you know someone who's got kids who are tired of learning through a screen. It's about yeah. the whole world just raise their hand and we're talking with all of them right now. That's awesome. All right, guys. So I want to start off a question I've been asking a lot of people um, in the industry. We've had panels with footwear and apparel and, and product and retail. And I ask everybody the same question because I do think it's it provides a lot of um, knowledge for different people going through these situations. So, Michael, I'll start with you. You know, I've been asking a lot of people, what immediate challenges did your company face? And I guess what pivots have you guys made since the pand pandemic hit? Yeah, so I think we'd probably be a, like the industry as a whole probably increased its demand. Like there's been more online behavior. There's been more people sitting at home, more captive audience. So I think if anything, it probably supercharged work more than we probably expected. Um, and I think where you naturally got that, oh, freak out, COVID's here, we're going to go backwards, kind of catapulted the other way. And it was actually playing more of a pivot to catch up and work out processes and systems and stuff like that. I think from a business point of view, we... we uh, pivoted towards a, a B2B model in one part of our business because it's been demand from a number of players within our category. So I think the excitement there was probably cool because I think instead of having to just focus on, on your own backyard and the B2C side of the business, there was plenty of potential there. Um, but definitely, I think it's it's been a busy couple of months and I know the guys on, on the phone would definitely be uh, experiencing that as well. Yeah, yeah, Shane, I'd love to hear from you how your business, because again, all the numbers I saw is just um, you know, view time and and view rate and Twitch streams and everything just went through the roof, especially in March, yeah. and that's continued. Uh, but we'd love to see how you guys maybe the, some of the challenges you faced, and also um, anything you guys did to kind of, I guess, not capitalize but take advantage sure, of more of sure. the, the eyeballs. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a roller coaster, quite honestly. I mean, you know, both uh, personally and professionally. So just. From a personal standpoint, uh, my in-laws were actually a couple of the first people in the wow. U.S. to be diagnosed with COVID. Uh, yeah. They were on that Princess cruise ship, mm -hmm. and they ended up getting wow. quarantined on the cruise ship. And I mean, my father-in-law, quite honestly, was like on the verge of dying. He was in the in the ICU. We said our goodbyes. We signed wow. a DNR. Like it was crazy, and that was in early March before it had really affected the rest of the U.S. Um, so, you know, when that happened and miraculously he survived, super grateful for that. That's um, awesome. but you know, like it, it was very real to me and, and at no point did I ever think, okay, this is, this is a hoax. You know, this, mm -hmm. this was very dangerous. It was very real. So it was something that we took really seriously. Um, so, you know, in that sense, we were fortunate from a business standpoint, we had a lot of meetings on the executive team to discuss you know, all of the different scenarios that could take place. Um, and we put in uh, a lot of time and effort into planning. Um, you know, what, what could we do? What will we do if this thing, you know, really affects us, affects our business? So we cut We had a lot of contingency plans. We cut a lot of costs across the board. You know, we were really preparing for some sort of economic fallout, um, which, which has, you know, uh, really safeguarded us in many ways. But what we didn't anticipate, like you said, was... Oh, you know, with shelter in place for yeah. the industry to do the exact opposite. And, you know, I, I yeah. in a way, I feel almost guilty that like, you yeah. know, our, our, we're benefiting our industry, our video game industry is benefiting financially from this horrible thing that's, that's affecting so many other people in such a negative way. Um, so, you know, that, that was something that we didn't really expect, you know, from a digital standpoint, certainly, 
It's been fantastic. I mean, uh, the, the numbers in March and April, we, we had more revenue. Uh, I think our, our, our revenue was up about eight X eight times. Um, we, we got more, our, our revenue in April was equal to our first three months total revenue. So, uh, you know, from, from January through March. So it was just crazy. You know, we didn't expect anything like that to happen. And it was, it was fantastic. One of the challenges though, that we face, so maximum games, we still do a lot of physical distribution. Um, right. obviously brick and mortar is not having a good time right now, you know, and GameStop. supply chain, I'm sure as well. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's been brutal. GameStop, Target, Walmart, Best Buy, like, you know, our orders have been cut significantly. You know, they've been trying to adapt with like curbside pickups and all that right. stuff, but it's just not the same. So luckily to a large degree, our, our digital has really offset the, the decline in physical, but, um, you know, I, I'd say like we planned early, we were pretty fortunate, uh, when it came to all of that, um, from a, from an employee standpoint, uh, you know, we were used to working remotely to a degree. We had a, a, a one day work from home policy per week. That was some, just kind of like a fringe benefit that we allowed people. So, uh, everyone kind of was already used to it. We had systems in place. People had their home set up that they could work from. So it was a fairly easy shift um, in that regard. Project management was a tricky one. So I had our entire department shifted over to JIRA to be able to handle uh, all of the, the project management on a, on a global standpoint. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of other things that I'm sure we'll talk about throughout the course of this, but those were, those were kind of the, the main things we did right off the bat. Yeah. And then, uh, Ray, I know you even mentioned, I think before the show that, you know, you had, uh, or, or you just did mention you had a big event with Nintendo kind of planned and those things, like a lot of us that had events at the South by Southwest and Coachella's of the world, um, obviously all that stuff got postponed, but yeah, we'd love to see as well, how that kind of affected your business, how you guys pivoted. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the short story is, is our business is a completely different business from where it started in January. Uh, our core business prior to COVID was large scale events and uh, conferences. So you go from having um, an entire year of booked business, including tours in Brazil, uh, E3 showing South by Southwest as well, um, to having to reinvent what we do overnight. Um, and fortunately, we were able to do that by focusing in on our core products. So, you know, in, in uh, effect of empowering creators, which is what we do as an organization, um, we just had to change our definition of what a creator is. So rather than being just a game development creator, we're now looking at how do you apply the same sorts of um, game development best practices to things like training, education, re remote learning. Um, and, and because we relens that focus, is similar to Shane's experience, we've actually experienced explosive growth. We had three enterprise clients in January. We now have 109 uh, as of earlier today, which is just insane. And at the same time, transitioning from an in-person office to uh, something that is now managed fully remotely around the world. So our business has transformed dramatically. The people are the same for the most part, but what we do day to day is very different. Um, one one thing, if you wouldn't mind me, yeah. sorry, just interjecting, Ray reminded me of, um, one thing that actually did affect us also is from a physical event standpoint, yeah. um, we had a lot of plans around GDC, which takes place in March, um, so we had a huge, uh, press event. We already had booked the space. We had planned everything and, you know, purchased all of the, the stuff to, to make the event happen. We also had a global press tour that was planned in March, uh, in, uh, that was literally like a roadshow across France, Germany, Italy, the UK. We had mapped it all out. We had four different developers that are planning to travel the world, you know, like all of those costs and travel expenses. We had to just, we had to cancel all of that. Like it was literally in March, and we just had to make a call. Like, is this thing real? Is this actually happening? Like, so we ate a lot of money, and that's something that you know we couldn't we couldn't pivot. Like, there's just no way that that we could you know make GDC happen or make these events happen. Yeah. Um, we tried moving as much as we could to more of a digital format and doing some presentations via like Discord or live stream. But you know, at that point, it was so early and so difficult that it, it was really hard to pivot that stuff. Yeah, and Michael, I think you know what's interesting about this time is it really has accelerated, if you call it the digital revolution. That I think if those those people that didn't really believe it or weren't a part of it, I think they've been forced to to think that way. But it's interesting from a marketing perspective. You know, conferences like you guys mentioned, traditional marketing, out of home, billboards. You know, 
brick and mortar, a lot of those things retail were taken away out of your marketing plan and you went all in the digital. How does that change the course of this industry forevermore? Because I'm sure a lot of people have now seen, wow, this digital thing or this digital marketing campaign works so well, we're probably going to pull back on traditional methods potentially forever. Yeah, uh, I saw it in like two ways. So a lot of people stopped spending. So CPMs actually yeah. dropped, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice if you're a performance marketer. So I think short term goals and, and, and for a company like ours, we, we obviously rallied up in terms of our spends during this time and have seen kind of good success off the back of it. I think where you probably miss and when you look full circle from a, a marketing perspective, it's it's the long-term brand stuff that you lose with physical, outdoor, sponsorship, mm -hmm. any of those kind of partnerships in the physical. So I think that's probably, uh, uh, probably a concern for 12 months, 24 months down the track is that you can kind of nail and the metrics can go up and you can obviously have the, the strong social, digital, paid performance side, but you lose a lot of that physical heartbeat traction. Um, that, and that's the bit we're probably most worried about and we're going to have to find more solutions. I think where gaming and esports are, are lucky is that there's such rich uh, diversity in the, in the talent portfolio that you can kind of partner with. So I think whereas sports may be a little bit more seasonal in terms of like if we look at something like the MLB or the NBA, really worried, condensed seasons, worried how to use talent, resting, sickness, all of that. We're really lucky we've got guys that sit and can operate just like we're doing now from home um, and be streaming all the time. Yeah. So I think that's probably one bit we've kind of looked at talent and, and building really genuine partnerships, knowing that we're going to have to play the brand uh, long game, which we already had part of the mix. But yeah, definitely, definitely concerned, David, for sure. Yeah, and Shane, I think I'm not a gamer I would, by any stretch of imagination, but right when COVID hit, I went out and got my PlayStation for the first time since college and uh, fired up NBA 2K. But what's interesting is I've recently downloaded you know, Call of Duty and Madden. Yeah. I didn't go out and get that go. physical. He's back. Uh, yeah, so I'm a gamer now. He's back. Um, <laughs> no, but I think um, you know what's interesting about that is that's just so easy. Just press a button and download. So I would love to hear from you, Shane, like where you think – uh, again, the digital acceleration is going to come into play going forward from digital to physical and how the market's going to, going to shift. Absolutely. Again, I mean, yeah, like, you know, we, we all knew the shift from, from physical to digital was inevitable. We've seen it happen in the music industry. We've seen it happen in the movie industry. It was only a matter of time before it happened in the gaming industry. Yeah. Um, I do think though that, you know, this, that COVID is going to be the catalyst that, that really, moves it forward much faster than anybody ever anticipated. Um, you know, not only is it getting, is it changing behavioral patterns for people who were more likely to purchase physically, but it's also widening demographics. Like you said, I mean, you know, people who maybe put down games because, you know, they, they had a family or, you yeah. know, got more involved in their career, whatever the reason is, they're now starting to pick it back up again. Right. Yeah, and, and that's something that, uh, that is really widening the market um, and, and the demographics. The question is, are those people going to continue to play post COVID? Yeah. Um, I think the answer is yes, a certain percentage of them will. Right. Um, but yeah, from a, from a marketing standpoint, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic because there's a lot more people to reach, um, you know, from a physical standpoint, not so great. Like, uh, like I've already talked about, um, but, you know, we were already so heavy uh, from, a, from a marketing standpoint on the digital side. We didn't really do any out of home or, or quote unquote traditional marketing. You know, we're, we're not spending big budgets on like TV, for example. We're much more likely to do a, a, pro, a programmatic buy, right? Or, or a, a CPC or CPM type buy well, online. From a, from um, a retail standpoint, how were you guys before COVID kind of set up in terms, I guess, yeah. sales, digital versus physical? For sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we still have, have a, a large portion of our business coming from physical on the maximum game side. But, um, you know, generally speaking, like digital offset any loss that we that we had in physical. So we That's weren't good. we weren't that I mean, it was, you know, a blessing in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but 
you know, I'd say from, from our standpoint, the two things, well, trade marketing, retail marketing was, was a big one. Obviously we're spending less on retail marketing because we're not making as much revenue when it comes to physical retail. So, yep. you know, things like in caps and, and all of that stuff where we've shifted those to digital. Um, but you know, the, the two things really that have been affected for us, one is, um, physical events with consumers, right? So we would go to the, the, you know, PAX or EGX or, I mean, there's all of, uh, E3, right? All of these, these uh, physical events around the world. So what we actually did to pivot with that is um, we tried to find interactive ways to, um, uh, to, to, or, uh, to interact with the consumers. So we're releasing more demos online, we're releasing more betas, you know, giving people the digital experience that they would otherwise be able to, you know, experience in a physical environment. That's actually been super, uh, like it's been one of the best marketing tactics that we've had. It takes a lot from a production standpoint, but um, it's been incredibly successful for engagement. Um, and then the other part is uh, press events. You know, we would always go and, and have a, a big event or multiple events where we'd bring a bunch of journalists in to see the game in advance, you know, write their previews, their, their coverage. Can't do that in this environment. So what we've been doing is, like I said, closed kind of private live streams to create yeah. like via discord or, or whatever. And, um, uh, to, to Michael's point, you know, what we're realizing is we never needed physical, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's, it's way We don't have easier. to fly out 19 people. Yeah. I mean, New it's York. crazy yeah. to think of all the, the yeah. time and money and energy we put into this huge tour of like all of us take so much time and money and coordination. Mm -hmm. And all we have to do now is send out a scheduler and be like, hey, jump on our Discord and we'll show you yeah. the same thing. It's like, oh my God, why didn't we do this in the first place? And it's the same thing with E3. You know, I, I, there's always a time and a place to meet with people in person. I think there, there is something that's very valuable with that, but there's and there'll so be a, much. There'll be an overcorrect period after this whole thing yeah, to totally. see where people- Absolutely, 100%. And there's gonna be yeah. a surge in these physical events where mm -hmm. everybody's gonna wanna go out and go to the next PAX or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Um, or Comic-Con. But with that said, I think that what businesses are realizing is what they were kind of just traditionally used to doing, that it's not necessary anymore, right? Like we're, we're all kind of in this, this massive kind of shift to digital and we're, we're realizing where those efficacies are. And there's a lot of advantages to it. You know, I'm not saying physical should go away, but, um, we're, we're adapting in all new ways that are making our business way more productive and way more cost efficient. I came across this stat. I'm sure you guys probably know like the back of your hand, but the global video game market is forecast to be worth $159 billion in 2020. That's four times box office revenues and almost three times music industry revenues globally. So Ray, I'd love to hear from you. We've all known it for quite some time how huge this industry is, but why do you think it doesn't get the same respect? And do you think... Again, this this uh, this COVID moment potentially thrust the video game uh, market into the forefront because I think a lot of people in marketing maybe look at box office and music a lot differently than than gaming. Yeah, I think that's a great question and, and one I love answering. So uh, first off, you know, a lot of people aren't aware that Mario is now thirty five years old. Um, that we are now in a generation of gamers who grew up with famous IP like Mario, Sonic as their friends. Um, now, most of the marketers who occupy executive roles um, across industries grew up a little bit before that, if you look at the age demographics. Uh, so I'd like to rewind the clock maybe 100 years before that and imagine being an adult when the first Nickelodeon machines came out. You'd turn the crank, you'd see the little thing, maybe the boy bounce on his ball, and you say, oh, that's cute, that's cool, uh, that's, that's a kid's toy. And you'd probably grow old and die thinking that was a kid's toy. Uh, if you were a kid back then and it was just one of all the forms of expression available to you, you might see something different. You might see an opportunity to express yourself in new and interesting ways, one that could actually reach and move humans uh, like a movie. And you'd probably be the generation of directors like Hitchcock. So what I think we see right now is a generational shift in gaming as not being as a kid's story. This is a new form of expression and experience as elevated and as important to humans, if you just look at the span, as movies, books, plays, TVs. And also, if you look at games like Last of Us 2, by the way, congratulations, Anthony, that's a phenomenal game. Uh, I know he's gonna be listening to this. 
uh, it moves humans. It moves it moves us forward as humans. If you look at esports and the competitive nature of the top leagues out there. Uh, they're they're vying for the level of focus and insight, uh, creative strategy that you have in the, the top of the NBA or the MLB. There's nothing yeah. different about games except for you don't have to go to a crowded stadium and potentially catch COVID to get them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we see that transformation across the board with uh, augmented reality in particular, my industry. Uh, a lot of times what we're trying to do is, is either replicate or enhance an existing human interaction with technology. Um, video games have been doing that for years. Video games have been figuring out how to get us in interesting, compelling thought loops uh, to get us more engaged with the subject. And we're starting to see, you know, in-person experiences that we used to take for granted. Like, oh, you need to get in person to establish your brand value. Well, it turns out you don't need to be in person. We just all stuck in that certain way of doing things. Now that we have a hard reset button on society, we see, we see what's really important. What we see is really important is understanding like real human connection. Like we have to be able to make eye contact with someone that's critical. You can do that through a screen. Maybe not as ideal, but you can do that through a screen. You need to be able to see something uh, in space. You need to be able to move around it, get a good concept of it. You can do AR and VR these days. There's a lot of things which we'd say are you know, must-haves for the human experience, which now not only being able to replicate digitally, but also enhance. And that's where I think the real crossover point is. It's not just football, but digitally. There's a lot about League of Legends that is better than football. The strategy is more complex. It evolves dynamically. It's stuff that's happening at a much faster rate than a, a bunch of people who've been making decisions the same way for 100 years can do. So digital media in general can iterate much faster, converge on much more ideal solutions at a rate that just blows physical media out of the water. Like League of Legends itself, was a mod, if you follow back Dota all the way on Warcraft 3 Edit, that was a mod that iterated on a digital ecosystem way faster than you could have done with people just kicking around a physical ball. So the evolution of these games, and look at like Roblox turning over like $250 million to creators, is creating the birth of new genres in real time because people are voting with their dollar and steering the evolution of games at a pace that just absolutely blows everything else physical out of the world. I'm going to steal that. I, I keep on saying the acceleration of like the digital movement or revolution, but I love the the hard reset on society. That's a good one. I'll have to steal that. Um, Michael, I mean, you've you know, really interesting company that you work for and you guys have really core in the market. Again, if I'm in Vegas and I go to the MGM Sportsbook and the Lakers are favored by seven against the Raptors, I want to put some money on that. And what you've done there for, um, obviously for the esports and gaming industry, would love to hear how that company came about and how successful that uh, that industry is as far as people betting on on these games yeah so it's probably it's definitely boomed in the last four to five months with no sports on that's for sure yeah um but i think like the key and probably the the bit that will mirror is like viewership and wagering always mirror each other so that as you kind of build that out there's an actual portion of that population that wants to transact and I think as you kind of go through that process, um, you cut that it grows kind of in a linear uh, fashion. Now, I think where I get excited and where you probably the most potential is it's rare that new sports come onto the market, right? Yeah. I think probably the the newest or and, and we we can't really call UFC a new sport; it's mixed martial arts. But it's probably the best evidence of a, an essential brand that's come on like you would almost see a game come to fruition. That happens all the time in our industry. So there's there's indie games, there's like top title games, where uh, that is a massive benefit for obviously our category, but so many other categories. Um, it's not like the NFL where you're wa- or golf where you're worrying about how uh, old the audience gets. The cool thing about ours is what's coming next, how do we iterate, how do we grow? And I think for us in our space, it's, that potential of because there's always something new, um, there's always a, obviously a new market to open, um, a new sport to like a new esport to wager on, which is which is pretty cool. What's the? Um, can you share like the most amount of money or most amount of bets? I guess on any one tournament or game that you got you've seen in your your time there. I think like the best one to focus probably like CS:GO is still um, like number one league. Dota they're kind of like. Uh, in their own league, the three of them kind of are the almost the spearhead of, of our space in terms of volume. Um, we've seen we've created two new products. One's a virtual product, so it, it runs essentially twenty four by seven. So it's old matches that you can essentially wager on, and then the other is um, streamer. So it's actually being able to wager on Twitch streamers. Mm-hmm. So instead of having to look at a team to play, 
you can go and bet on like Ninja or Tifa yeah. or any of these guys sitting from home. So I think that's that's kind of like I'd say sport is like so um, basic in terms of like you'll you'll get 300 yards or you'll get number of strikeouts right. and you kind of your market capacity is almost stuck. Gaming, you've got the skill side of it. You've got the streamer and the talent side of it. There's so many different ways to kind of grow that space. And I think that's the kind of potential one. If, if I would like, we'd be naive to say that today is, is, is where all the kind of strength behind the esports wagering space lies. It's, it's definitely tomorrow. Um, and we kind of mirror off the back of the success of everyone else. So I'm pretty excited. Can you guys do parlays too? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, I think we're, we're the only company in the amazing. world where you can, we're the only company in the world you can um, parlay your own skill into like an esports team into a streamer. So wow, this, that's catch so this cool. one for you. You can bet on Ninja to win his Twitch game, okay. uh, whatever he's playing, let's call it Fortnite, uh, into uh, an esports team. So let's call it like Gen G to, to win their match into you playing from home. So like that's, <laughs> that's like pretty crazy in terms that's of awesome. like, the depth and um, the crossover that we get in terms of what we can offer. All right. And then, you know, like I mentioned to you guys earlier about my um, PlayStation NBA 2K purchase, as someone who recently dropped a hundred bucks on getting some extra VC so I can get uh, my ratings up, <laughs> I want to bring up uh, an article you actually recently shared on LinkedIn, Ray, which is talking about the microtransaction economy, um, both being the present and the future. And maybe the business model overall shifting from single unit to this reoccurring revenue model based on active users in these games. So I know you have some thoughts on it. Would love for you to speak on it. Yeah, absolutely. This one is uh, you know harkening back to the days when I was building MMOs myself. Um, this one was long coming, and there's a lot of in, a lot of iterations that have occurred in this space, which is, have enabled it. One is being able to make digital transactions in the first place. That's a relatively new thing as far as humans go. Um, what that really means is it, 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 it's an order of magnitude decrease in the overhead to make a single transaction, which all of a sudden enables a 99 cent purchase to turn into a profitable outcome. Um, yeah. So that's happened recently. Another thing that's happened recently is the ability to enable an individual creator to monetize their content directly. That used to be much more difficult to like create a, a shop on eBay, for example. Um, now I can create a small little microtransaction shop in a, in a creator economy like Roblox, sell virtual hot dogs, and, and make a living wage. So that's, that's created a really important positive feedback where now let's say I'm in high school, I'm a, I'm a teenager looking for what I want to invest my time and money into. I've got Stanford, which is going to put me in debt if my parents can't pay me to get there or I'm going to get a scholarship or I could create a shop in Roblox. Um, my friend who's got a shop in Roblox is now making 50 K a year as a high school student. And my other, my cousin who's going to Stanford, is now in debt up to her knees and worried about the future because she's having to pay that same thing and the education system is going uh, up, upside down. So it's a really easy choice when you look at, I want to have fun playing video games, I want to make something, and I want to get paid for that. Uh, what that really does for, for a bigger uh, economy is that it enables individual creators to be their own bosses. All of a sudden, instead of having to go get a traditional job, we really lean into what is going to become a creator economy um, not just for video games. Video games is where it starts because there's that iterative loop that's much faster than everywhere else. But it's going to start applying a lot of spaces. Like I'm really interested in, in Valve's rumored partnership with Apple and what that might mean when, when Valve really pioneered the in-app transactions with, uh, with Source and uh, Steam. What does, that, what does that look like in the, the Apple ecosystem? Are they going to go microtransactions directly through the Apple Store? It would seem like a no-brainer at this point. Um, and we're already starting to see other people lean into that. But what, what happens when Uber can allow you to directly transact without having to build their own monetization scheme? Then creating monetizable content as, a, as an individual app developer, the barrier of entry goes really low. Everyone on earth can start to make compelling content. And instead of big apps, you start to get these micro experiences. And this gets really exciting as we start to see blended content between various ecosystems. Things like seeing Twitch crossovers to app ecosystems to in-game footage. All those connections are going to accelerate at a pace we're not really prepared for. And before you know it, you're going to be able to spend virtual currency on you know, little small things. And who knows before it's, I want to spend a dollar for my McDonald's French fries. I'm going to be spending like, Apple coin for that directly. And I can also earn Apple coin by making something in an ecosystem. To me, that future is accelerating toward us incredibly quickly. Yeah. And Shane, that was going to be my question to you for your company. You know, does Maximum Games overall, do you start offering the games for a buck and then everything you know, you make your extra 50 bucks all internally in the game with those microtransactions? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I wish it were that easy. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously the, the cost of production that mm-hmm. is a, a major factor that goes into this. So, you know, the way that our company uh, is kind of modeled is, is definitely more around premium games. We do have a free to play game that we haven't announced yet. Um, and, you know, that's, that's going to be a pretty big endeavor for us. But, you know, I, pr- prior to Maximum Games, I worked for Tinyco, which was a mobile video game company. And, you know, so I, I know how the free to play business goes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 very volatile, you know. And and the thing about a free to play game is it costs a lot more up front. I mean, you know, because mm. you got to get the people into the funnel, or you're not going to monetize. So you end up having to spend a lot more on marketing. And if you don't get those concurrent users, you're dead in the water, right? Yeah. So it's much different from from a, a premium model, especially when it comes to to marketing, but also on the production side, making sure that you have all of those systems in place to be able to retain people and incentivize them to come back and optimizing the monetization to make sure that it's, you know, you, you got that sweet spot. Um, it's, and, I mean, you know, it's all psychology. You need like a bunch of psychologists absolutely. on your team to <laughs> absolutely. figure it out. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, there's, and that's, that's what a lot of these mobile companies, you know, are, they're, they're brilliant at doing that. You know, it's, it's all, yeah. I mean, you're, it's, it's the psychology of, of making money really. Um, but you know, like, yes, it is something that, that we're doing. Um, it's for us at this stage, it's, it's risky to go to put all of our eggs in, in that basket, honestly. Um, but we also know that it is the future. And I think that the landscape is changing so rapidly. Um, you know, looking at what's happening with, uh, games that are going to start being streamed from the cloud, looking at, uh, all of these subscription services that are becoming more and more popular. You know, people's, if you think about it like like Netflix, right? People's uh, attention spans are decreasing. And with so many options, you need to hook them right away. Yeah. You know, if you don't hook them right away, it's gonna be like, okay, oh, well, I'm, I'm paying 10 bucks a month for this fee. I have a hundred other games I can go take a look at. So mm-hmm. that's where, you know, we're also considering a lot of other things like, what is the onboarding process for a player look like right at the beginning of the game? What does the tutorialization look like? How do you hook someone within yeah. the first five to 10 minutes? Whereas historically with a premium console game, it's like, okay, this person's going to pay 60 bucks. You damn well know they're going to invest at least four yeah, hours true. before they quit. You know, that's not the case anymore with, with the, the way that these are going and, and, and streaming and subscription models. So, you know, we are thinking a lot more about that. How do we, how do we hook people right away? How do we incorporate some of those um, kind of additional monetization levers? But it's also really tricky because if you're going to ask people to pay uh, a premium to get in, you know, if it's not the free-to-play model, it's like Call of Duty, right? You pay full price and then they have additional layers for battle passes and yeah. uh, um, cosmetic content that you're going to pay for. The scope of your game better be worth it or you're just going to piss people off, you know? Yeah. so. There's also there's so many variables that, that come into consideration, and it's it's absolutely something that that we're testing, and we know that like we have to get into it. It's just we're we're treading lightly because it's a it's a very complex business model. Yeah, and the, the psychology too of like I want it now. Just like you can play the game for a couple of weeks and get to this level, or you can just pay to get to the level immediately. Like I just I love the psychology of that. Um, Michael, I wanted to talk to you because I've often thought this as well is esports is for the last few years has really been this shiny sexy object that everybody's talking about but we mentioned the numbers earlier I, th- I think if i have this right esports is like in that billion dollar category annually and we just talked about the game market's 159 billion yeah definitely. Um, so, I, so i know you've thought a lot about although esports is gets all the headlines and is the sexy topic of the moment uh people seem to forget about gaming overall on that yeah i think like the probably the first one was that guys were uh, who were investing in it or interested in it probably didn't know the space. So esports almost acted as a really nice vehicle for that conversation because we could mm. put it back to sports. We could relate it and say it was somehow it's viewing, it's next, it's going to follow the same kind of structure or strategy that we've seen with sports. Yet if you look at kind of the way that viewership works and the fragmenting of kind of the audience of esports um, and the real value there, it, it doesn't follow the same probably path as sports does. There's, there's elements that do replicate it and then there's elements that don't. Um, 
And if anything, like, and, and not to bring COVID up again for, for, for a point's sake is mm-hmm. if anything that made it powerful during this time is it's the ability to see how well gaming does online and, and it, it always has and, and will. Um, sports, you're left for dead. If you're not, if you can't get to an oval, if you can't get to a space, if you can't follow that, you're really stuck. And so I think if anything that esports can really lean on compared to gaming, I, I, I genuinely believe gaming doesn't need any help. Gaming's, if you're not on board for gaming and you're not understanding how to utilize it or, or invest in it, uh, you're silly. Like you, it's like, you've missed it. It's, it's been, it's still there, but obviously you've missed the boat in terms of its impact. I think for esports, the cool thing is how do you jump on this ability that the online element um, is really the bit that makes it different and keeps it safe, even post COVID. Is that when you kind of when when life returns, is that ability to be on twenty four seven? There's you can be on at 11, uh, 11 p.m., two a.m., three a.m. at night. The, the sports doesn't have that infrastructure. So I think for me, uh, if, if w- the way that we look at it is like, how do you do stuff with gaming in mind? Esports is one of the the pillars um, that makes that makes gaming rather than the kind of center pin of, of right. gaming. Yeah, I love to open this up to the full panel too. I know you guys saw um, iRacing on Fox got a million viewers back in March, uh, which was the you know the largest viewership obviously of any esport event on television, and then the um, 2019 League of Legends, I believe, uh, grand finale had more viewers than the Super Bowl. So I guess my question is for brands uh, overall, Fortune 500 brands, et cetera, how far do you guys think, and I'll start with Ray, we are away from esports and and gaming, being able to monetize the eyeballs the same way traditional TV has done, where you talk about the Super Bowl, 5.6 million per 30 seconds, but obviously League of Legends and, and these different events are not getting that type of revenue, but they probably should if you talk about the pure eyeballs. Oh yeah, you know what? I think that was what I was going to add on to uh, Michael's answer is that yeah. uh, you know what's really sexy about esports for me in particular is that the viewership of it it becomes a spectator sport um, in ways that maybe watching someone play an individual single player game or even a multiplayer game before esports was maybe less compelling. There was a, there was a smaller market um, certainly for you know being able to have large brands advertise. So I'm a futurist. You'll notice a lot of my answers are going to be in that direction. And I want you to, for a second, imagine for me a world that's coming very soon where, um, you know, looking at million dollars spent on Super Bowl versus a million dollars spent in, in League of Legends for ads is, is going to be a no brainer towards League of Legends. And the simple truth is that when I put a single ad up in front of the Super Bowl, it's the same ad for every single person watching it. Um, and for better or worse, look at how important it has been for Facebook to be able to cater ads to your individual eyes. Yeah. Um, so there you get to take that huge brand association with a major event and personalize it uh, when you incorporate that advertising into a digital technology. Um, and that goes beyond just, you know, single use ads. That really goes like to understand your whole life cycle as a viewer of these campaigns. Like, you know, there's a lot of behavioral analytics that'll show you're more likely to purchase an automobile if you've done these three things that leading up to searching for that ad in Google. Those sorts of long-term behavioral analytics are going to give advertisers an unprecedented view into our mm. purchasing uh, category uh, behaviors, and, and that's going to be transformative. I think very soon, looking at spending on old traditional ads will seem silly. It's just going to be like throwing money into the wind um, until you have a really clear understanding of your target audience down to the demographics and how those ads are going to be applied to each cohort of that, uh, that audience. I don't think that physical is going to really be able to compete with digital here in the near future. And then Shane, we've seen it in the, in the space, right? Like the keyboard company and Monster Energy and some of the things that um, kind of represent the gaming industry, they get it. But again, those traditional brands, um, it just, for me, it makes so much sense that they have to take a look at that as part of their marketing. Absolutely. Yeah, I just think, you know, esports is still relatively in its infancy and, and traditional brands aren't taking it seriously at this point. They don't, they just don't get it, you know, and, and they will because it's inevitable. Uh but, you know, think about, think about sports and Michael already kind of spoke to this, but uh, this is a, this is a global sport. You know, it's, it's a, it's a global thing. Like you get, yeah, soccer is a huge sport around the world. Not so much in the U S you know, football is largely American, but you're talking about video games, which literally every territory around the world will be interested in that, you know? And, and so there's a different scale uh, involved with esports and, it's a demographic that just continues broadening and, and it's an inevitable thing. And then once you 
incorporate all of the the digital components and the live streaming and the physical events and the global reach and like the targeting capabilities like yeah there there's there won't be anything like it and and i do think that it will you know it'll probably uh, covid i don't know if it if if it hurt or not because i think traditional advertisers are still going to be looking for ways to do tr- more traditional marketing right um but you know it it i would say in the next three to five years, I think we're going to see uh, a massive shift in, in the way that more traditional brands look at video games and, um, you know, how they can, how their brands can be represented within uh, esports. And Michael, I'll share another silly story with you, but, you know, actually, I'll admit that me and my friend um, put five bucks on a Madden game and put it on simulation and we're cheering for our teams as if we're watching a live sporting event. So, I mean, I'm sure that that, that speaks more to what Did you're you doing in terms of put, putting money. I won. I had the Chiefs versus the Baltimore Ravens. Patrick Mahomes uh, played a great game. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that speaks to what you guys are doing on the betting side. But any any additional thoughts, I guess, on when, this, uh, when people wake up, I guess? Yeah. Uh... I, I think they already have. I think culture is a big one. Like uh, I think Shane and, and Ray would probably like, I think Shane, you mentioned something earlier about the, the cultural element of music and entertainment. Um, mm. And that was massive for sports when kind of you look at music and the way that music and sports have kind of coexisted. I think if anything, that's kind of really helping drive that narrative, especially for esports, is some of the investors that have obviously come on board and, and kind of invested into teams. The fact that like streetwear, some of these things that have kind of almost made made oh, people have thought that gaming wasn't cool maybe 10, 15 years ago was a thing in the basement is, is suddenly kind of getting recategorized. You've got NBA, uh, NFL players playing when they've got a um, – Bronny is, uh, is literally playing all the time on Twitch, um, LeBron James' son. So, like, I think – the whole cultural element of what it used to be a gamer and the age they're, they're of a making, gamer and all cool, of that, is all, all of that stigma is, is, is going and it's going fast. Now, the cool thing is, is it doesn't get rid of, and, and what I love about the industry, um, I'm, I'm traditionally from a sports industry, is the gaming industry is great because they still honor and really respect the guys that have kind of pioneered and, and, and are loyal to their community. But at the same point of time, there's this massive potential space. So it's just it's being able to see both at the, at the same point of time. Because what you don't want to do is kind of see the, the carrots almost and go running after it and then lose what is so great and core to the success of, of a lot of these titles. So, um, yeah, I definitely, like, we're ex- like super excited. I know the guys on the call would see the same. Like, if, if anything, this is kind of probably stirred or, or given a little bit more enthusiasm and passion towards the space. Um, despite kind of all, all of the tough stuff that's going on at the moment. I'd love to add to that, if I yeah. might, as well. It's a different lens on the advertising and marketing in, in gaming, and that is shifting the definition of what gaming is. Um, for example, we've got clients like Mercedes-Benz, MasterCard, Sprint, who are using um, filters or augmented reality layers, gamified experiences to sell that's their cool. products and to advertise their products in new ways. Um, so I think we're going to see a massive influx of people in, you know, Snap AR filters, um, in uh, Instagram filters as a new way to reach audiences. And then here's what's really special about it, you know, because I, I pitch them this all the time. What's really special about it is the same thing that makes video games special as a, as a medium of expression, that is interactivity. That is, as soon as someone starts interacting with your product or service, they're more bought in. They care more about it. And that's one of the things that gaming as a sector can do uniquely as, as opposed to a big blast, uh, you know, spot in front of a NFL uh, video. Um, being able to draw your audience in, make them make decisions, and maybe even make it fun in, an, in a Facebook filter. Is that a game? I don't know. It depends on your definition of game. Most gamers would probably say no. Most people outside the industry would probably say, oh, yeah, it smells like a game. It touches like a game. It plays like a game. It's probably a game. But I think it really depends on what your definition of game is. Regardless, advertising money is there. They're looking for new innovative ways to reach people, especially because of COVID. And Shane, a lot of uh, CMOs and VP of marketing listen to this program. And if you could put your consultant hat on for me, you already have a hat on. You're, you're in perfect shape here. <laughs> uh, and I'll ask the rest of you to do that as well. But you know, if I'm the CMO of Swiss Army, Monster Energy, White Claw, um, you know, these different companies, um, that you see out there, where do you think the most undervalued attention is in the gaming or esports space? That if you were sitting as a consultant on one of those boards, you're like, guys, we gotta attack X. Good question. 
That is a good question. I mean, I, yeah, there's, there's a lot of directions this could go. Um, I mean, I think just from an eSports e standpoint, uh, I think merchandising is going to be massive. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, Michael could probably speak a lot more to that than I could, but just from kind of a peripheral standpoint, I, I see that being one of, the, one of the big levers that more traditional brands could pull. And eSports is not my, that's Michael's expertise, but yeah. so... You know, but that from, like I said, from a peripheral standpoint, like I could see that being a huge, huge market that's untapped. Michael? Uh, I'm like sponsorship first, like get, get your hands like dirty, learn what works, learn what doesn't, build trust. Like if anything that you want to do with a brand and you're thinking about long-term like brand awareness and feeling comfortable and right in the spaces, we've seen some bad examples of brands that kind of come in and and dabble for half a minute and then that are out. And I think if you look at the brands that are starting to make headway, so if you look at some of the telcos, some of the um, uh, um, Maccas, any of those, like KFC probably is, is the best example of guys that are actually really kind of committed to it. I think that's the best spot to go. Don't, don't kind of dabble your foot in the water and then kind of run away from it. You've really got to go, hey, we're going to test this, but we're going to back it up with, two years, three years, five years. And I think that's where the gains will come. Anyone that wants to kind of do it as a 10% test part of the budget now, if you're not doing it with that long-term kind of thought, I, I'd say you kind of, it's, it's more detriment to the brand. Yeah, I think. it's funny because I obviously am in the social media space and it's, it's, it's the same thing, which is if you're not going to be genuine to the platform, then it's not going to work and the consumer is going to be able to fish you out and say, we don't trust your brand get out of here. Yeah. But if you actually take it seriously and you're genuine, you're going to have a lot more success. Yeah. And like one, like one tip is like, go and watch like an event and go and watch ads and sit in the Twitch chat. And it yeah. is, uh, it, you, nowhere else it's not like you're watching it's like maybe twitter right is probably an example of that that only really counts with the super bowl it's not like people are watching ads at home where you're seeing that level of interaction yeah, yeah. some of it's sour it's negative but you really see that if you really butcher it it's, it's an audience time. that'll it's an audience that'll let you know and i think yeah. when you kind of when you get it right a lot of people that that initial sentiment of, of hating an ad or hating a brand over time slowly drifts away as people start seeing your contribution to the space. And I think if you just come in to the, with, uh, to the gaming audience with your own brand in mind and you don't look at how you facilitate them, teams, partners, leagues, any of those things, I think you kind of, you're, ripe, you're ripe to kind of get shot down. Whereas if you come in with how can I build the space, how can I grow it, how do we learn at the same time, I think there's massive gains to be made there. That's awesome. Ray, I'm guessing you're going to lean towards virtual reality on that question in terms of the undervalued attention people can take advantage of, but I'll, I'll let you speak. Yeah. Thank you for uh, teeing me up there. Of course. Um, well, I'll, I'll hammer home a point I've been mentioned a few times here. And I think for gaming in general, one of the most underserved opportunities, especially from the marketing standpoint is helping people tell unique stories and stories that are their own. Uh, you know, gaming, is, as far as I'm concerned, it's really just the natural extension of the, the cave painting or the story around the campfire. You know, what's different about gaming and previous mediums of expression that came before it really is that interactivity, that ability to become part of the story, make it unique and make it your own. Um, and I think to Mike's point, it's really important that when brands are thinking about how to lean into a gaming or esports marketing campaign, it'd be how are you helping your brand align with a story that is unique to your audience? What about this genre resonates with your brand? You know, you wouldn't want to put a, uh, a car commercial in front of a scary movie if you don't want that sort of feeling associated with your brand. Make sure you understand the game genres and understand how that's going to resonate with that audience and what those audiences get out of those brands. Now, to your point exactly, you know, we've had people from innovative auto manufacturers to telcos to we've actually had political campaigns now for the 2020 election reach out to learn how they can use augmented reality to gamify advertising. Um, which, you know, those two buzzwords 10 years ago would have made me cringe. I don't like the word term gamification. I'm sorry it exists, but let's just describe the process by which you make something interactive and engaging. If you can do that with an advertisement or marketing campaign, and you can do that remotely through a breakout technology like augmented reality or virtual reality, uh, you can really stand out amongst the pack. Now, with augmented reality in particular, which is, you know, our bread and butter, uh, augmented reality actually allows you to bring real-world interactions into the space that you're at. 
it allows you to free your world in a way that we're all craving right now, being locked indoors for so long. Um, so what I'd recommend for folks that are interested in, in leaning into gamer esports is take a look at some of the innovative spaces and the innovative work being done in augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and then if you're really interested in talking shop, you know, our doors are always open and we are working with top brands right now. Cool. So I want to make sure I go around the, uh, the panel here one last time before we wrap up and just have you guys give me some of your predictions, some of the things that you're excited about for the industry. I know like Ray mentioned, we've had this hard reset on our society, things have changed, things have accelerated. So Michael, I'll, st I'll start with you. Um, where are we in this industry, you know, three, five years down the road now that everything has been so accelerated in 2020? Uh, we still keep ticking up. I think it keeps growing. I think you'll see if I'm um, to do the sports comparison, you'll see some leagues go bust. You'll see some teams really struggle. You'll see our space, especially esports, continue to go up and, and to grow. I think probably less on the, the brand integration side. I think the real value will become from the players and the personalities. And I think they will really lead the charge um, and then mix that in with kind of the de developers being that kind of superpower, just like we've seen with like the Googles and the Apples kind of almost yeah. owning and Amazon's owning their infrastructure. I think um, the developers will continue to kind of hold and, and lead that space. So I think we'll probably see another maybe eight to 10 really strong titles join those kind of two or three that have been leading the way in terms of the top esports titles and then mobile 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 i just think mobile gaming will continue to be massive everyone's got a device it's a really low barrier to entry and then with cloud gaming now happening it just means it's so much easier for people to access so yeah that's that's kind of mine i probably stole three of the three of the guys areas to pull yeah those. before i go to shane real quickly you know how important do you think it is for the individual athletes, if you will, with these games. I think Ninja was a was a, a gamer that really crossed through that threshold of kind of getting to more casual fans of knowing who he was or what he was about. I guess as we look at the next three to five years, is that going to be really important for the industry to build up these individual personalities and make sure there's that incentive for people to be bought uh, in? Yeah, definitely. I think that that'll be kind of like a natural way of like – producing or kind of getting awareness out of the game. I think where I'm probably more interested in is how many of the sports, music, all of those guys are going to have to make that a part, like a string to their bow in terms of their offering, how they kind of relate to fans and audiences. Like if I'm a talent manager, I'm an IMG yeah. or Rock Nation or any of that, every conversation I'm having with these guys is how do we get more of our talent playing games? Yeah. So I think it's and probably... And we saw what happened when Drake and Ninja teamed up. I mean, that was... Yeah. A Totally. Yeah. I think for me, it's more about um, how if, if you do have that scale or that audience, mm. what are you doing in relation to gaming and esports rather than gaming and esports relying on these talent to kind of work? They'll work w without it. It's probably just a, a, a boost in, in what's going on. Whereas if I'm a big sports star, I'm thinking what if I'm LeBron James and I'm coming out to, up to retirement, how am I investing in the space? But how am I getting involved with it as well? Yeah, it's a great point. Shane, what are your, what are your uh, predictions? Put the crystal ball in front of you there. <laughs> yeah, full on VR haptic yeah. suit. Yeah, go with yeah. my yeah. future. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, like like Michael said, mobile, mobile, mobile. I'm gonna say uh, content, 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 because I do think that you know, mobile is is king right now um, for a lot of different reasons. The accessibility, obviously, the the ability to track. Uh, a lot of KPIs and digital metrics and optimize and whatnot. But I really think the entire industry is heading that way. And the content at some point, the platform is going to be agnostic. It's just a matter of how you get it. Yeah. Done, you know, and uh, whether it's, you know, what Google is doing, obviously with Stadia, you know, you can play it on the phone, you can play it on your computer, on, it could be, you know, streamed from your TV. Um, at that point, it's really just going to depend on what your content is and how yeah. good your content is and how well suited it is, uh, you know, for the, the the audience that you're trying to reach. There's always going to be different segments within the gaming market. There's going to be short experiences, immersive experiences, right? Like VR is going to be on one end of the spectrum as immersive as it could possibly be. And then there's right. always going to be the, the five minute, you know, Candy Crush games. Um, but, you know, I think as long as you're developing good content for the right audience there's always going to be uh, a need for that and then you know however you know whatever the monetization looks like um remains to be seen 
Um, but obviously, uh, you know, the, the landscape is changing with streaming, the involvement of big te uh, tech companies uh, getting involved in gaming. I mean, come on, it's only a matter of time until Amazon rolls something out. Uh, you know, <laughs> we know, we know they're going to do something. Bezos um, has a little bit of extra money. I think he can, uh, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned before, subscription services, I think they're going to continue getting bigger and bigger. You've seen Microsoft putting a lot of emphasis on their game pass and, and they're getting a lot of people signing up for that. PlayStation has, has something similar. Um, there's a number of, of companies and competitors coming into that space. Uh, the PC market in particular, I mean, we've seen vast changes in the PC market mm. just in the last year. Uh, actually, Steam, the number of games on Steam has declined for the first time in almost a decade in, in wow. 2019. Um, because, you know, you've got these publisher stores. You've got Epic uh, coming in. You've got GOG. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, EA's Origin. All of these competitors are coming in because the market is becoming more mature. With a more mature market, you get more competition, uh, more users, and I think a lot of gamers are also starting to understand more of that kind of agnostic direction, and so they're kind of moving towards PC, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think um, uh, eSports is massively untapped. Um, I think that's, that's another uh, landscape that's, that's gonna be prime for some huge, huge things in the future. Um, and I, you know, I was half joking about the whole haptic suit thing with VR, but I really <laughs> do think like, it's funny a, a few years ago, you know, we made a, we made a, a game for PSVR launch. Um, and after that we stopped because the install base was so bad on VR. It just didn't make sense from a, a, a an investment standpoint, but we recently went back and looked at the in install numbers and they're actually pretty damn good. Like, hmm. you know, the adoption rate of VR isn't stopping. And, and I think that at least in my opinion, like the true next level of immersion, gamers always want more immersive experiences. The next logical step for full immersion is virtual reality. And it just yeah. seems like it's only a matter of time until we're full like Ready Player One. You know, like I, I have to imagine I have to imagine where, I don't know if it's gonna be in three to five years, but like there's gonna be a want, a need, a desire for that. And I think that there's gonna be a bunch of, of markets that pop up um, around those super highly immersive experiences as well. All right, take us home. <laughs> All right, well, you know, if, if we went with the content, 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 I wanna jump in with diversity, diversity, diversity. I'll start with a little anecdote that my partner is not a classical gamer, and yet, thanks to Animal Crossing, she is now spending quite a bit of her afternoons and evening times watching people stream and play Animal Crossing. Um, so none of the traditional understanding of what a gamer looks like, but all the traditional behaviors. Um, I think that we're seeing a massive influx of what we would traditionally be considered non-gamers into the gamer market, um, partially accelerated due to COVID, partially because we're just now at a time and place where we can enable people who aren't used to playing games to jump in and have different access points to kind of ramp up. Um, she right. also started playing Mario Kart 2 now. So it's like a gateway drug, right? You start off by farming and pretty soon you're going to be shooting people in the head on Call of Duty. <laughs> um, what I think is really interesting about all the points raised today is, is that there is going to be a diversity of different entry points and access points for gamers in the near future. Um, you know, will there be haptic suits in, in AR or VR? Uh, that doesn't take five years. We actually did that last year at E3. We didn't, of course, we didn't get a chance to check it out. We had a two and a half hour line around the haptic suits in AR or VR. Is it the holodeck yet? No, no, no. That's going to take a while longer than five years. But we're going to be slowly inching our way there. Will there be a Ready Player One in five years? No, back to diversity. Um, I think that was an incredibly compelling uh, piece of uh, reading and movie. But, it, you know, the, the future multiverse or uh, metaverse, if you will, it's not going to be one core platform. You know, much like you said with uh, all the difference, you know, like Steam and Origin, um, there's going to be a bunch of different 3D ecosystems out there. And they're, they're starting to emerge right now. There's even some, you know, emerging esports already in augmented and virtual reality that are really exciting. So in five years, we'll see the same sort of diversity we see in video games as we do in modern reality TV or, uh, you know, regular movies in general. Um, many more people, you know, from old to young, from male to female, everything in between will be playing video games. And if the industry is smart, it'll get ahead of that and create games for this new diverse audience. Um, we'll see an increased influx of people who care more about making people feel included, helping them feel like they belong in the industry, and making sure that someone, uh, anyone that wants to enter the industry has something for them. I think that's what we'll definitely see within five years. Awesome. 
Um, well, gentlemen, it's been a great conversation. Thank you so much for dropping all the knowledge and appreciate all your insight and uh, looking forward to talking soon. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Thanks, you guys. Being here. All right. Thanks so much to Mike, Ray, and Shane. Um, just a great conversation. I know I learned a ton. And, you know, Will, I asked there towards the end because I think it's important. A lot of people that listen to our program may be in sports, entertainment, different brands, retail, like we mentioned. Really, the spectrum is all over the industry as we as we speak. But, you know, talk about undervalued attention and the ability to maybe be first to market on some of these opportunities because the eyeballs are there, man. Looking back at that stat I shared, you know, League of Legends uh, tournament, had more viewers in the last year's Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl is getting 5.6 million per 30 second ad. So you talk about, you know, getting the same amount of eyeballs for way less money. Uh, that's just one example, but uh, they they broke down a ton of examples of how brands can get involved in this uh, amazing space. Yeah, and I think they did a good job of making it very um, user friendly or listener friendly. Like you don't have to know a ton about the industry to relate to the points they're making. And yeah, what Ray said is, I mean, if you, you can get you know, for a fifth of the price, you know, the same amount of eyeballs with and growing in League of Legends versus a yeah. traditional Super Bowl market. Um, so yeah, I think things are going to change, and those guys seem like they definitely are aware of it. And it's only and bad. that's where I think the change will be when more of the Fortune 500 brands start to really invest in that area. Because, like I said, right now it's you know a lot of um, you know the keyboard companies and you know the companies that kind of are in uh, gaming. Because I think people potentially think that the only way you can market is to the gamer specifically but like all three of them mentioned like there's a lot of people watching that aren't quote unquote gamers don't consider themselves a gamer i've personally i don't consider myself a gamer at all i've watched hours and hours and hours of ninja streaming on twitch and and you know so why don't you market to me and my personality and, and what i enjoy so that's just going to be something that i think happens and again we'll be accelerated because of everything going on in our country and our world right now yeah, back to the whole digital revolution thing. People are at home looking for new things to watch. And yeah. all of a sudden, you have David Brickley uh, playing 2K and watching Ninja Stream and, and all kinds of things just, like that. Just so, wasting all his money on VC to get a new uh, wardrobe and the uh, get a new haircut. You know, just nobody's uh, my if I can't if I can't buy a haircut in real life, why not in uh, NBA 2K get a fresh fade? You know. All right, um, this is a social podcast, another panel edition. Will, thanks so much for setting these up and all the uh, scheduling coordination per usual. Um, we really would love for you guys to check out the other panels that we've done as well. And we've done some mini episodes. So check all those out on iTunes. If you're so kind and you find value out of this absolutely free program, feel free to give us five stars right there on iTunes. And if you listen to the audio only version, maybe you're in your car, maybe you're at the gym. Don't forget we're on YouTube if you ever want to uh, pull that up easily and uh, see the beautiful faces that uh, are the guest of the Business of Social. All right. Thank you so much to David Ferker. Thank you so much to producer Will Kelly. This has been another edition of the Business of Social podcast. I am your host, David Brickley, and it's been powered by STN Digital. <laughs>